My name is John Cullen, and I want to tell you a story. It's a story about a scandal, broken relationships, gossip, rumors, money, corporate rivalry, and curling. It's the story of Broomgate, how a single broom, yes, a broom, turned friends into foes and almost killed the 500-year-old sport of curling. It was a year I'd like to forget. Broomgate, available now. Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. For nearly a quarter century, it has been synonymous with getting a correct answer to your question. That is a powerful title to hold. In a sports argument with your friends at the bar, just Google it. Can't remember when that album came out or who played that character in that movie or what time the restaurant opens. Just Google it. Having a medical issue? Like, say, you're passing a kidney stone and you need some advice on how to speed up that process. Well, just Google... Actually, don't Google that one. Because the new and improved AI-powered Google will tell you to drink pee. Yep. That is how you go from being synonymous with the truth to everyone asking, what happened to Google? Why did you do this to yourself? Who asked for this? And does Google even know how Google works? I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Max Reed is a journalist and a writer. He is the former editor-in-chief of Gawker, and he currently pens the excellent Read Max Substack. Hey, Max. Hi, thanks for having me on. You're welcome. I'm going to start by asking you, uh, has Google now completely rolled back uh, its AI answers, or are they still trying to, like, push through this somehow? No, believe it or not, they are uh, full steam ahead. They claim to be very happy with the results so far, and uh, they seem all in on uh, these AI overviews. So for those who haven't seen them yet, because most of our listeners are Canadian and hasn't really shown up here yet, I don't think, um, explain what Google's AI overview is and how, you know, everything being equal, it is supposed to work. Yeah. So uh, the idea is that when you enter in a search query into Google and you write out either a specific question or a set of terms, that uh, Google's AI will scan uh, the first few results and create, um, using large language models similar to the way ChatGPT works, a kind of summary of what they've found. So you might Google something like, why is the sky blue, just to use the kind of the most three-year-old question imaginable, and it would scan the first, you know, however many articles and create a kind of synthesized answer. However, what might you get, perhaps, when you Google why is the sky blue? I mean, one of the things that uh, the LLMs are not so good at is understanding context online. So, I, you know, there's there's been on Twitter, maybe some of your listeners have seen already, people collecting screenshots of what uh, the AI overview feature has actually been serving them up. So, for example, I have seen a screenshot, somebody Googling how to pass kidney stones quickly. That's probably a relatively urgent query. And the AI overview recommends that you should aim to drink at least two quarts or two liters of urine every 24 hours, which I don't think any doctor would actually recommend that you do. Or a question, which U.S. president went to University of Wisconsin-Madison? As far as I know, no U.S. presidents went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. But Google claims that 13 presidents did and earned 59 degrees in total, including (laughs) Andrew Johnson, who is on the $20 bill and was president in the early 19th century, earned 14 degrees at University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1947, 65, 85, 96, 98, 2006, 2007, 2010, 2011, and 2012. And don't forget the glue to prevent the cheese from sliding off your pizza. (laughs) Yeah, perhaps most famously was for a while there, if you Googled how to stop cheese from sliding off pizza, the AI overview would recommend that you add one eighth of a cup of non-toxic glue to the sauce to give it more tackiness, which was discovered that this was being pulled from a quite clearly tongue in cheek comment from uh, somebody on Reddit whose screen name is vulgar enough that I probably shouldn't say it out loud on the podcast. How would... Google's AI program 
pull these specific and obviously fraudulent answers out of the ether, uh, given everything that's available to it? It's an interesting question that I think the best way to answer is to sort of explain the kind of obvious method of how we work when we search Google. What I mean by that is when you put a string into a Google search box, Google the website doesn't really have a sense of what precisely you're looking for. So if you Google something like cheese sticking to pizza, Google doesn't know for sure that what you want is instructions for fixing this problem that you have. It may be that you're looking for a movie scene where cheese slides off the pizza, or it may be that you remember a post by someone called Blank Smith on Reddit, and you want to find that specific post because it was so funny to you. And because the Google search results can't really tell what you're looking for, it's going to give you all of these different kinds of results on the page. Now, you, a human being who's got years and years of uh, brain development allowing you to figure out what you're looking for and how you want it served up to you quite quickly, can pick out the result you want. But the large language models that Google is using don't have that ability. They can't tell what's a joke, what's serious. They can't tell what's instructions, what's description. Um, They're quite good at putting all that together into a single paragraph that syntactically makes sense, but often conceptually, it's totally deranged. When we talk about rolling this out and I guess the amount of flack or at least ridicule that Google has gotten for these wrong answers, uh, its AI is coughing up. Why would they do this so quickly and stick to it through this embarrassment? I guess, why would they want AI in their answers? What problem does it solve uh, for them as a company? Well, I can give you the Google answer, which I think is part of the answer, which is that the vast majority of queries that they're receiving and for which the AI overviews are being created, it's working pretty much as designed that the ones that we're talking about are sort of edge cases. Right. People are playing around. Yeah, people playing around, people looking for strange answers. And I think Google... Uh, as an institution, as a corporation, imagines that they can eliminate these sort of edge cases either manually. It sure sounds like some of the funniest ones, they're actually going into the results and making sure that those stop appearing, uh, or they're just fine-tuning and tweaking the model. The other thing that's going on in the background is that ever since the introduction of ChatGPT by OpenAI uh, almost two years ago, there's been a sort of conventional wisdom coalescing in the tech industry that the company most threatened by Uh, OpenAI and these generative artificial intelligence apps is Google. Um, There seems to be a sort of belief that eventually ChatGPT will be accurate and uh, user-friendly enough that rather than going to Google to find answers for things, you're just going to type it into the chatbot text box and get the answer from ChatGPT. Personally, I'm a little skeptical of this conventional wisdom, but it's big enough that when OpenAI was releasing things quite quickly, and when Google seemed to be sort of behind the curve on AI, its stock was hurting significantly. Hmm. And so I think part of what's behind Google's commitment to this is a need to show shareholders or investors or, uh, you know, whoever is setting the conventional wisdom in Silicon Valley that Google can do AI and it can do AI better than anyone else. What about for the average Google user who is simply um, trying to pass a kidney stone or keep cheese from sliding off their pizza. What purpose does this serve beyond what they could get from, you know, to your point, using Google the way we've used it for two decades now? If I'm being generous, I can imagine a lot of situations where you're Googling something that really has a specific and definitive answer. And, you know, the way Google has worked over the last couple decades means that increasingly, if you Google, I mean, in in the U.S., the sort of joke question is, what time is the Super Bowl? Right. Which is famously Googled so frequently that newspapers and digital outlets will compete to have the top result for a page that says, what time is the Super Bowl? Because that page is going to do so much traffic. Now, that's not actually a particularly user-friendly system. There's a factual answer to the question, what time is the Super Bowl, that there doesn't need to be a sort of marketplace of competing explanations for what time it is. Hmm. And from Google's perspective, why wouldn't they just pull out what the time the Super Bowl is and paste it at the very top of the page and make it easy for everybody to get? That's the sort of generous read for what it adds to to searchers, that there is a certain number of questions are fairly straightforward questions that Google can use its powerful AI technology to give you more or less the direct answer. But I think it's a sort of open question, one, as we've seen, whether or not this actually works, and two, whether or not that's actually the best 
use for Google and the best way that Google might be uh, using its sort of dominance of the search mindshare? Okay, this is the premise of what you wrote, because your piece was called Google Doesn't Understand How Google Works. So explain how Google is at its most valuable to a user and how that's different from what you just described. Let's go back to the um, what I was saying before about the sort of ability of Google to dredge up a bunch of different, um, what we would call domain diverse answers to a given search query. That when you enter something into Google, you don't necessarily want a straightforward factual answer. And in fact, Google's original purpose, you know, when it was founded uh, nearly 30 years ago now, was to help you find specific websites online um, at a time when that was much harder to do. And to the extent that Google is crowding out that ability, it makes it much more difficult to uncover the information that you're looking to uncover um, and to find the specific things that you're looking for. Um, And, you know, in some sense, again, I think there are probably people within Google who would say that I'm sticking up for a kind of Google or an older Google that people don't really want anymore. Hmm. But I think that underestimates the extent to which Google is real infrastructure for the internet and a kind of foundation for a lot of uh, what exists there. And if you eliminate the ability to gather and collect all of these different domain diverse websites that are offering you different aspects of your query, whether it's direct links to ironic posts that are specifically straightforward answers to what you're looking for or in-depth explanations that you might actually want to go through, you end up with something that uh, is no longer has the necessary diversity to support, you know, to support the AI overview, frankly. The island of Newfoundland keeps its secrets close, shrouds them in mystery. But once in a while, the fog is lifted, the truth comes out. I get a feeling there's something going on here. My whole body was shaking. You go to bed believing that you're a certain person one night, and then all of a sudden the next day, everything that you've known is not true. This is not the life that I should have lived. I'm Luke Quinton from CBC. This is Come By Chance, available now. I can't remember how many times I've been searching, uh, I don't know, for some stats about a particular uh, an athlete. And you put his name into Google and all of a sudden you've gone down a rabbit hole uh, about like, look at, look at how this football running back ran people over in high school and here's a video, right? You don't get that sort of like blast of context from across the internet that you can then like kind of get lost in. No, of course. And I think, you know, part of what's happening here, and I should, you know, I admit some bias here as a journalist, is that Google has for a long time been a really important source of traffic for media. That was a huge one for you guys at Gawker back in the day. Yeah, well, we used to, we had to, we had to expand into all kinds of different, you know, we we were pushing for anything. It could be incredibly cynical. It can be incredibly sort of uh, lowest common denominator, let's say. Right. You know, for a long time, Huffington Post had a whole sidebar called Side Boob, which was just people searching for their favorite celebrity and whether or not they had ever appeared in a revealing dress, basically. And I'm not going to defend the Side Boob vertical on Huffington Post. Right. But that Google traffic is important, not just for those things, but for information about uh, Israel and Palestine, for information about local elections. And if Google is going to start making the most prominent result something right there on the page taken from other publishers' websites, that's going to do a lot of damage to publishers' bottom lines. Let's focus on uh, the user perspective and how this rollout and the fact that they're sticking to it might affect the way people use Google in the future. Uh, Going back to the what time is the Super Bowl, if I had an AI overview right now and I typed in what time is the Super Bowl and they gave me the time, given the context I have over the past few weeks, I would probably still be scrolling down to see the actual sites to confirm it for myself, right? And so once you lose right off the top that sort of claim to authority, um, I don't know how people adopt this kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, this is why it doesn't make a huge amount of sense to me from a long-term business perspective. I think a huge aspect of Google that is that makes it so successful is that it's able to project a sense of neutrality and objectivity. Right. And you can critique that, and it should be critiqued, and it has been critiqued. But in general, th- there's a kind of agreement, I think, that what you get when you search something on Google is usually speaking the best set of results for that particular search query. And one thing that allows Google to maintain that kind of neutrality is it really 
almost never presents information as coming from Google. It's always like you Google whatever you're Googling and you get 10 results. Mm -hmm. If you Google who should win the presidential election, I mean, this is a this is a totally abstract example, but you'll get 10 different results from a range of different sources. Right. And you're not thinking that Google is recommending a particular candidate for you. Now, what the AI overview does is gives a kind of sense that Google has found an official answer for you. Now, I think Google is trying to design it as much as possible to deny responsibility for what's being produced there. But it's really hard for me, even somebody, you know, who spends his time thinking about and knowing about LLMs and platforms and giant tech giants, not to just imagine that when there is a big block of text at the very top of my Google search results with no sort of link attached, sourcing somewhat hidden, not to imagine that that's that's what Google's saying. And all of a sudden you have this problem where um, instead of thinking of Google as a kind of neutral or objective source that's giving you options for what you might want to read and you can read multiple different viewpoints and you can come to your own conclusions, you're given a kind of straightforward, almost voice of God, voice of AI answer to the questions you're having. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, that puts Google in a kind of strange and, and, and difficult position. I mean, not, not least of which because all of a sudden Google becomes subject to the same kinds of criticisms that platforms like Facebook and Twitter have about favoritism and political bias, um, that those become much more relevant than maybe they had been in the past. This is a question we could base an entire other episode on it, but I'd be interested to hear what you think about what's at stake here for the tech industry that would cause a, a company like Google to stake its, you know, reputation as kind of the point of authority on internet searches on uh, what is clearly, at least so far, some wonky technology. I mean, we're speaking this week right after uh, Apple announced that the new iOS and the new iPhones will have ChatGPT incorporated from the ground up. Apple is a company that would stake its reputation on its security and its uh, and its ability to protect your data. Why are these massive companies taking these leaps into what, at least to uh, a layman like myself, appears to be like the unknown? There's a million different answers to that question, and some of them are internal to the companies, and some of them are almost unutterable. But I think the the, the sort of broad strokes uh, story of what's been happening in Silicon Valley over the last few years is that growth has become more difficult to find. You know, for most of the 2010s, uh, the big platforms, sort of the giants of Silicon Valley, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Apples, were able to find new markets relatively easily and grow quite quickly. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. You know, they were newer. There were fewer people using them. Something that gets cited a lot is low interest rates meant that it was much easier to find money, to build out infrastructure, to help you grow. Hmm. You know, money's a little more expensive now. Growth is harder to come by. Um, we seem to be entering a, a new phase in the tech industry in Silicon Valley. And I think people are really desperate for a new leap in technology on par with um, the internet or the iPhone that opens up new markets, that opens up new uses, that allows those profit margins to increase and allows the stock prices to keep going up. And I think AI has been the subject of an extremely effective hype campaign, in part because I think we can all admit that these technologies are pretty unbelievable, that it's been almost two years since we first started playing around with ChatGPT, and we're pretty used to it by now. But when I was first playing around with it, it blew my mind, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very easy to talk yourself into a kind of, well, this tech is really only 80% of the way there, 70% of the way there, but it's going to get all the way there really soon, and we need to stick it into our software right away because we've got competition on all sides because we don't know where the profits are coming from over the next couple of years. And it's really important that we push this as hard as possible. I mean, as as you could probably guess from how I'm talking about it, I don't really agree with that view. It seems like a kind of a short-sighted and silly view for a bunch of reasons. Mm -hmm. But I understand that, you know, the the sort of hope here, and I think I think we saw this with crypto in 2020, 2021. Right. The hope here is that this is a generation of technology that gives us another decade plus of absurd growth and absurd profit margins. Can Google afford to do this because there is basically nothing it could do right now that would knock it off its spot as the go-to place for search? Like, you know, I've seen geeks and people who are highly online talk about uh, using DuckDuckGo and other search engines, but really, like, no matter how bad uh, this AI overview turns out to be, is it is it going to be a danger to Google's place in the market? 
This is a question that I genuinely don't know the answer to, and it's kind of the the million dollar, the billion dollar, the hundred billion dollar question of the tech industry over the next 10 years. I mean, I think a lot of Silicon Valley's resistance to regulation and antitrust enforcement has rested on the likelihood or the possibility that the current giants could be toppled as easily as IBM was or AOL was, that the sort of cycle of disruption in software and hardware is so intense that there is no real protection. Hmm. Certainly, there are some people who believe, as I was saying before, that OpenAI, for example, is enough of a threat to Google that it really could be toppled. Um, And I would not necessarily make a bet against that. On the other hand, my instinct is to say that you know, the moat, so to speak, to use the the business school term, that that Google's ad- advantage here, as you as you're saying, is so intense in terms of the data they've gathered, the the graph they have of the web, the sort of knowledge and information that they've amassed over the years, that it would be very hard for them to really screw it up so badly that they allow they would allow a competitor to overtake them. You know, there's Bing, there's DuckDuckGo, there's competitors, but to me this is a kind of Coke and Pepsi situation. And I just don't see it's it's hard for me to imagine the future where Google disappears the way AOL did. Uh, well, then we, I guess, got to hope that they managed to get this stuff right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, an interesting, something that's sort of interesting to me is I've seen um, some Google competitors, I mean, this is maybe not quite the right phrase, but I've seen some Google competitors arise who promise to serve you up search results without the sort of AI frippery and the ads that are currently clogging Google up. You pay 10 bucks a month and you get access to a search engine that just gives you good results with none of the extra stuff. But if you dig under the hood a little bit, they're just using the Google search API. That They're hmm. just pulling the exact same Google results. They're just removing all the stuff that everybody hates about Google right now. So it's like a $10 unpremium Google <laughs> charge. Yeah, pre- precisely. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think there's a kind of that that's informing my answer here. It's if that's still what the best is, that's just what the best is. And I guess that, you know, those of us who are in the know can pay that extra 10 bucks and not have to look at the AI stuff. But for now, it doesn't seem like anybody's even coming close. Uh, Max, thank you so much for this fascinating conversation. Uh, love reading your Substack. Thanks for having me on. Max Reed. You can find him at readmax.substack.com. That was The Big Story. For more, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can, yes, even Google us to get there. To leave us feedback, you can send an email to hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or you can call 416-935-5935 and leave us a voicemail. Joseph Fish is the lead producer of The Big Story. Robin Simon is also a producer on this show. Stephanie Phillips is our showrunner. Sound design this week was handled by Robin Edgar, Mark Angley, and Christian Prohom. Chloe Kim is our research assistant. Mary Jubrin is our audience development lead. Diana Kay is our manager of business development. And I am your host and your executive producer, Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We are Frequency Podcast Network. Altogether, that's a division of Rogers. And you are a listener that I would like to thank for sticking around to the end of the show. We'll have a couple of surprises, although they're not really surprises anymore. You know what to expect in In This Economy episode and maybe a trip back to the past on Sunday. And then we'll be back with a fresh big story on Monday. <laughs>